Hi, right, engineers. In this video, we're going to talk about the cervical plexus. The so cervical plexus is extremely important because it's going to supply a lot of structures the head, the neck, and even some other muscles that we'll talk about. Now, we're going to talk about in a series of videos, we're going to talk about the cervical, the brachial, the lumbar, and the sacral plexus. But before we do that, when we start going into all the detail and the diagrams of it, let's actually just quickly look at an actual anterior view of the spinal cord. Anterior view of the spinal cord. So if you look here at the anterior view of the spinal cord, this is actually going to be the spinal cord right here. So we're looking at the anterior view. Up here, these are going to be your cerebellum, medulla, pons, right? Now, out of the anterior gray horn of the spinal cord, out of the anterior gray horn of the spinal cord, so let's say, for example, this is our anterior gray horn right here. Out of the anterior gray horn of the spinal cord, you'll have these rootlets coming out, right? You'll have these rootlets coming out. And you'll also have some uh, things coming from the posterior aspect. Right? And they'll come together and they'll make this nerve. Right? So you're going to have these posterior and anterior rootlets that are coming out. Now, these are going to make a spinal nerve. But you know what's important? These are paired. So if there's actually on this side, so let's say that this is the left side, let's say that this is the right side, you'll also have that same spinal nerve coming from the opposite side here, on this side too. So again, let's say that this is right, and let's say that this is the left side. Right? This would be a spinal nerve, and this would be a spinal nerve on the other side. Now, this is important because when we take the spinal cord, we're going to separate it into a couple different segments or regions. So let's say, for example, we take this and we have a green section here. So let's say this section right here, this green section here, let's say that this is the cervical segment. So this is the cervical segment. Okay? And this is going to be consisting of how many spinal nerves? eight pairs of spinal nerves. So we're going to have eight pairs of spinal nerves. This is important. Now, how are these spinal nerves actually coming out? Let's pretend for a second. You know how we're looking at this in anterior view, right? Let's say right here, let's say that you have a, a specific bone right here. This, let's say this is a part of your occipital bone. So let's say this is a part of your occipital bone, right? And what happens is, Let's say right here, I'm going to have another bone here. Let's say I have my cervical vertebrae. Here's a cervical vertebrae. And let's say here's a cervical vertebrae. Right? So let's say that this is atlas. And let's say right over here is actually going to be the occipital condyles. Now, coming in between the occipital condyles and the atlas is going to be this spinal nerve. And this would be C1. So this would actually be C1. And it's going to continue. So if you go atlas and then you have another bone here, let's say that you have the next cervical vertebrae, and the next cervical vertebrae here would actually be axis, C2. Coming between atlas and axis is going to be what? C2. So coming in between these guys, you're actually going to have C2. And coming over here, you're actually going to have C2. And if we were to keep going, you would get the point. There's going to be, again, how many spinal nerves, though? eight pairs of spinal nerves. So C1 all the way to C8. And some people get thrown off by this C8. All that C8 is, is just the, the actual cervical spinal nerve that's going in between the seventh cervical vertebrae and the actual T1. Okay? Now, let's go into the next segment. The next segment is actually going to be the thoracic segment. This is the thoracic segment. Now, the thoracic segment is actually going to be 12 pairs of spinal nerves. So there's going to be 12 pairs of spinal nerves. And this is going to be going from T1 all the way to T12, right? And then if we keep going down, let's go down another one. We come down to the lumbar segment. So then we come to the lumbar segment. And the lumbar segment is actually going to be from L1 to L5. Okay, so if it's going from L1 to L5, then how many spinal nerves is that going to be? That will be five pairs of spinal nerves. So in this one, you're actually going to have five pairs of spinal nerves. Okay, then if we keep going down, let's say we go down to the next one, and we go to the sacral region of the spinal cord. Sacral region of the spinal cord, so sacral segment. 
So if we go to the sacral segment, this is actually going to be consisting of, again, five pairs of spinal nerves. Five pairs of spinal nerves. And this is going to be, again, from S1 to S5. And the last one is actually going to be the coccygeal segment, or coccygeal segment, right? And this is going to be primarily consisting of coccygeal one nerve. And we'll talk about that when we talk about the actual sacral plexus. So how many actual pairs of spinal nerves does that give us? Well, 8 plus 12 is 20. And then 20 plus 10 is going to be 30. And then plus this actual one right here. 31 pairs of spinal nerves. So how many spinal nerves is there total? There's 31 pairs of spinal nerves. Okay, now what we're gonna do throughout the series of videos is we're gonna break into each one of these segments. So we're gonna start off now in this video talking about the cervical segment, particularly that of what's called the cervical plexus. And then we'll actually, you'll see that the cervical plexus out of these actual eight pairs of spinal nerves, it's primarily only gonna be coming from C1 to C4 with a little bit of the C5 nerve root for the phrenic nerve, and we'll talk about that. Okay, so now that we should understand this, we should understand how the spinal nerves are coming out. They're coming out through the, technically through the intervertebral foramens in between the actual vertebrae. And this one will actually be coming in between the occipital condyles and the atlas for the C1 nerve, all right? Okay, so let's go ahead and start with the cervical plexus. So we said the cervical plexus should be consisting of these four right here, but we're gonna include C5 for the root, and you'll see why. So let's say we put here C1, and we're gonna do this in like a nice little schematic diagram here. So C1, we're gonna have here C2, C3, C4, and C5. Now, what's gonna happen is, C1, when it comes out, right, it comes out between the atlas and, and the uh, occipital condyles, right? When it's coming out, it's gonna give off two branches. So let's say here it is, and it gives off two branches. One branch moves this way, and it's gonna form what's called the superior root of the ansa cervicalis. And then you know what else is really cool? You know there's another cranial nerve that's actually running right in this vicinity? It's hypoglossal nerve. You know the hypoglossal nerve is actually coming through the hypoglossal canal? Within the occipital condyles, this is cranial nerve, 12. The hypoglossal nerve will come out of the hypoglossal nucleus, right? And when it comes out, it will move with this first cervical plexus right here, right? This first C1. Now what's really cool is C1 will actually give off a branch that will move with the hypoglossal nerve. So as the hypoglossal nerve is moving in this vicinity, it picks up a branch from C1. Now, when that happens, they run together. So imagine this. Imagine me kind of circling this whole thing here, and they're running in like an actual entire sheath here. Right? They're running in like this sheath. What happens is this C1 will come out, and it'll supply two muscles. Right? One of the muscles is going to be called the geniohyoid. The other one is going to be called the thyrohyoid. So it supplies two muscles. Now, the geniohyoid is actually one of the superhyoid muscles, so it's actually going to elevate the hyoid bone. And the thyrohyoid muscle is actually going to depress the hyoid bone and elevate the larynx. Now, out of this hypoglossal nerve, since it's already here, we might as well just show that the hypoglossal nerve will actually continue and it'll go to supply a couple other muscles. We'll have an individual video on the hypoglossal nerve, but I want you guys to know that it'll actually come out here, and it will supply a bunch of different muscles of the tongue. So it's gonna supply the styloglossus, and the styloglossus is actually gonna be one of the muscles, it's an extrinsic muscle of the tongue, and what it helps to do is it helps to be able to elevate the tongue, so it helps to elevate the tongue, and not only elevate the tongue, but actually retract the tongue. Another branch is going to be the hyoglossus. And the hyoglossus is actually going to be one of the other extrinsic muscles of the tongue which depress the tongue and retract the tongue. Another one is going to be the genioglossus. And the genioglossus is actually going to be important for being able to 
protrude the tongue. So being able to protrude the tongue. And the last one is it's going to give branches to the intrinsic muscles of the tongue. And these are going to be the ones that basically change the shape of the tongue. So whenever you have the ability to do like, you know, you can curl your tongue, that's the intrinsic muscles of the tongue. So again, we have the hypoglossal nerve, which is going to run with the C1. It's going to supply the styloglossus, hyaloglossus, genioglossus, and the intrinsic muscles of the tongue. C1 will give off a branch that runs with the hypoglossal nerve to supply the geniohyoid, which elevates the high bone, and the thyrohyoid, which is going to depress the high bone and elevate the larynx. Now, what else do we have here? Then, we said C1 is going to give off a superior root of the ansa cervicalis. Another thing that's going to happen here, look at this. C2 is going to move forward. And what's going to happen is C1 and C2 are going to give off these branches together. They're going to communicate with one another. And they have this communicating branch. And the reason why they have this communicating branch is coming out the back of this C1 and C2 connection, there's going to be a branch that moves with another nerve, another cranial nerve. You know, there's another one, really, really important one. Let's put this one in red. This is the vagus nerve, or cranial nerve 10. So cranial nerve 10 is actually going to be moving, and as it's traversing this way, it's going to pick up some of the branches from what? From this actual C1 and C2 connection. And they'll move together. So let's actually show that as they're moving together. So look at this. Oh, yeah, baby. That's awesome. OK, so these guys are moving together here. So there's a communication with the vagus nerve, all right? What else is going to happen? Another muscular branch that's going to be coming off of here is actually going to be going to some muscles which are responsible for flexing the neck and allow for lateral flexion of the neck. Uh, one of these is going to be the rectus capitis anterior. You know, the rectus capitis anterior is a very deep muscle, helps to be able to flex the neck right around the, it helps to flex the neck and it's also going to be flexing the neck right around the actual C1 occipital condyle region. So it's helping to flex the neck right around that joint process. Also, it's giving off another branch. The other branch is going to be the rectus capitis lateralis. And you can already tell what this one does. It's also going to be a very deep muscle that allows for lateral flexion of the neck. So it does lateral flexion of the neck. And then you're going to have another branch. And this branch is actually called the longus capitis. And this one also flexes the neck right around the actual atlas occipital region. All right. Then C2, we said that it was actually going to have another branch, right? Well, look what's going to happen here. We're going to follow it in a second. It's also going to give off an inferior root, and we'll see that in a second. Then C3 is going to move here. It's going to traverse forward right here. As it traverses forward, it's going to give off a branch. And this branch is going to interact with the C2. Watch this. It's, the C2 is going to give off a branch. And then these two are going to interact here. And they're going to give off a couple branches here. Okay? So there's going to be an interaction between C3 and C2. One of the branches is actually going to traverse this way. And this branch is specific. It's actually for the greater auricular nerve. And the greater auricular nerve, which is actually consisting of the C2 and C3 branches, it's going to supply the skin over the ear and the skin lying over the parotid gland. There's going to be another nerve that's coming out the back of this. So there's another nerve that comes out the back of this. This is called the transverse cervical nerve. And the transverse cervical nerve is actually going to be important because it supplies the skin on the anterior aspect of the neck and the lateral aspect of the neck. Okay? So again, greater auricular, skin over the ear and the parotid. Transverse cervical is the skin over the anterior and lateral aspect of the neck. Now there's another one. Sometimes there's certain controversy, and I'm going to make it a, spe a special color so that we, there's no confusion. But some literature will say that the C2 and C3 can make the lesser occipital. But for right now, most research is supporting that it's only going to be coming from the C2 branch. So we're just going to have that here. But again, realize that there is certain literature that it will say lesser occipital does carry some C3 fibers. So lesser 
occipital. And the lesser occipital nerve is important because it's going to supply the skin on the actual occiput. So it's going to supply the skin on the occiput as well as the posterior aspect of the neck and the actual lateral aspect of the back of the neck. So again, it's going to supply the actual occiput region. It's going to supply the posterior aspect of the neck and it's going to supply the lateral posterior aspect of the neck and even a little bit of the scalp. All right. Then C3 is also really cool. Look what happens here. It gives off another root and these two combine. Look at this. These guys come together and what happens is the C2 and C3 come together. When they come together, they form what's called the inferior root of the Anza cervicalis. Why is this important? Because the Anza cervicalis is going to supply a lot of different muscles. Off of this, there's going to be four muscles that will come off. And it's going to look like a nice little loop. So look at this. Here's the superior root, and the superior root of the Anza cervicalis is coming from C1. The inferior root of the Anza cervicalis is coming from C2 and C3. So let's write that here. So this is the, this one here is the inferior root, and this one right here is going to be superior root. They come together and they give off four branches. And these have to be in a special order from superior to inferior. Okay, they have to be. Because there's some type of lesion there could actually be affecting of some of these actual muscles and not of the other ones. All right, so what are these ones? So the first one, the first branch is going to be the omohyoid. Specifically, the superior belly. You know this omohyoid is actually one of the muscles that it's actually an infrahyoid muscle and also to be able to depress the hyoid bone. There's another one, which is going to be the sternothyroid. So the sternothyroid. Don't get this confused with the next one because the sternothyroid actually depresses the thyroid cartilage. The next one, which is just inferior to it, is actually called the sterno hyoid and this one depresses the hyoid bone and then there's one more branch here and this branch is going to be going to the inferior belly of the omohyoid so it's the omohyoid specifically inferior belly because you know they're connected through an intermediate tendon right inferior belly if you guys aren't sure of some of the functions of these muscles go watch our muscular anatomy videos okay because we actually go over all of these all right so now we've covered what is this big loop here called which is made up of the superior root of C1 and the inferior root of C1, uh, C2 and C3. This is called the ansa cervicalis. Okay, now, another thing. Coming off the back of C2, let's do this one in this actual maroon color here. Coming off the back of C2, it's going to give a branch here to these actual other muscles of the flexors of the neck. And they're going to go from C1 all the way down to C5. So I'll actually draw a couple of those afterwards. But these are going to supply the longest coli. And it's going to supply the longest capitis. And we already know what the longest capitis does. It flexes the neck. What do you think the longest coli does? It's also a very important muscle, deep muscle that also flexes the neck. And again, they'd be coming off C2 and they'd be coming off C3. So again, who is these? Longest. I'm actually going to denote these with just an L to say longus. So this would be longus capitis and longus coli. And this would be coming from C2 and from C3. So I'm going to erase this here again and just denote it with an L so that we have a lot of room here. So longus coli and longus capitis. Okay? Now, another thing is going to happen here. C3 is going to give off another branch here. That's going to go to your scalenes, particularly the uh, anterior and middle scalenes. Okay, so the C3 root, let's do this one in this doo-doo brown color. Actually, no, let's do pink. We already used doo-doo brown. Let's give off the C3 branch. A C3 branch is actually going to run near with this, and it's going to supply the scalenes. And it's also going to supply the levator scapula. Levator scapula. So if you know the scalenes are also very important for inspiration process, primarily forceful, so they help you be able to flex the neck and the levator scapula are also involved in elevation of the scapula. Then C3 
is going to give off another branch. Right off its root, it's going to give off a very, if you don't remember any of these, you have to remember this one. This is of the most important one. Okay, so let's draw here. Let's have a C4 right here. And let's have a C5 right here. What happens is, coming off of this C3, you're going to have a C3 here. It's going to pick up branches from C4. Okay, so you're going to pick up branches from C4, and then it's going to pick up another branch which is going to be coming from C5. So this is why that C5 is actually important. Now technically the cervical plexus is only C1 to C4, but again, C5 root is also important because it gives this branch here. Now, if you look here, we have this C3, C4, and C5 roots coming together to supply what? What will all of this give way to? All of this will give way to the most important nerve of all of these. This is the phrenic nerve. So this is going to the phrenic nerve. The phrenic nerve is one of the most important ones, and the reason why is because it supplies the main muscle of inhalation. That is the diaphragm, so it supplies the diaphragm. Any type of damage to the C3, C4, and C5 nerve roots could cause extreme damage. It can cause, if this isn't able to work, you could actually have respiratory arrest or respiratory failure because you're not going to be able to have inhalation activities occurring. Okay. Now, another thing happens here. So we got the, uh, this guy here. Now off of C4, we also said what? You're also going to have a branch going to the longest coli, and you're going to have a branch going to the longest capitis. Guess what else you're going to have a branch to? another branch to the scalenes and the levator scapula. So you're going to have another branch here which is going to the scalenes and a branch going to the levator scapula. I'm going to put L there for levator. And again, remember these flex the neck and this helps to elevate the scapula. Then another important one here. Coming from specifically C3 and C4. So now we're going to combine C3 and C4. This is another really important one. C3 and C4 will actually come together and form what's called the supraclavicular nerve. So this is called the supraclavicular nerve. And this is a cutaneous branch meaning that it's actually going to be a superficial branch. It supplies particularly the skin over the clavicle and the medial part of the deltoid, right around the actual acromion region. All right, now there's another branch, and then we have to talk about one more important thing here, very, very important after this one. But again, we already said that coming from C1 all the way down to C5, we would have longus capitis and longus coli branches. So let's show that. Again, we're going to have another branch coming here, and this is going to be for the longus capitis, and the longest coli. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make another little mini diagram because we have to talk about one more relationship, and that is the relationship with the accessory nerve. Okay, so let's come over here and let's talk about this accessory nerve. Okay, now if you guys will actually go into this in more detail when we get to the cranial nerves, but specifically, if I were to have for a second, let's say that I actually draw the actual uh, little view of the spinal cord here again. So let's say here's the spinal cord here, right? And let's say I get up to this point here, you know when you get up to this point here where the actual medulla is, you know here's the medulla, let's say here I actually draw the medulla here. So there's a cross section of the medulla, right? There's a hole in the skull here, and this actual hole is going to be called the jugular foramen. It's obviously out of proportion here, but I'm just doing it so that we can understand what's actually happening here. So this hole is called the jugular foramen. Now there's another hole where the actual spinal cord is moving through, and this is called the foramen magnum. What happens is from C1, so let's say here's C1, here's C2, here's C3, C4, and C5. What happens is is C5 gives off a branch that traverses upwards, C4 gives off a branch that traverses upwards, C3 gives off a branch that traverses upwards, C2 and C1 give off branches that traverse upwards. Now, why is this important? Out of this, 
you're actually going to have a branch that comes out the back and a branch that comes in the front. So what would this one be? This would be the posterior or dorsal ramus, and this would be the ventral ramus. And again, this would be the ventral ramus, and this would be the dorsal ramus. And again, if we had to continue here, this would be the dorsal, ventral, dorsal, ventral. Why is this important? This little cord that you see coming up here from C5 all the way up to C1, that cord right there that I'm going to kind of circle, that's running in between the anterior ramus and the, and the actual dorsal ramus, and it's actually just behind what's called the denticulate ligaments, which are pia mater extensions. This is called the lateral funiculus. And what happens is, this actually moves upwards. And again, what is it moving from? This is C1, C2, C3, C4, and C5. I'm only doing one side, but this would be happening on the same other side, right? As it moves upwards, you're going to have Let's say here is a specific nucleus here, and this is for the accessory nerve. So if this is for the accessory nerve, most of the actual fibers come from what's called the nucleus ambiguous. Now out of this, you're going to have this hypoglot, I'm sorry, the uh, accessory nerve, the cranial part of it. The cranial part of it will move through the jugular foramen, right? Now, what's important about this is this aspect right here. There's another nerve that runs with it. And this is called the vagus. Let's put this in blue. So this is actually cranial nerve 10. What happens is most of the fibers from the, the cranial part of the accessory nerve, this, this black nerve, most of the fibers go with the vagus nerve to supply a lot of the actual pharyngeal and laryngeal muscles, right? But this structure here, you see this lateral funiculus as it comes up through the foramen magnum? It'll actually run up through the foramen magnum and then down through the jugular foramen. When it runs out, it forms the main spinal accessory nerve. So again, the actual accessory nerve has this lateral funiculus, which is running up through the foramen magnum. And what happens is some of the fibers, very few of them, but some of the fibers from the cranial part of the accessory nerve is going to run up with the spinal part of the accessory nerve. And when these run together, they'll actually pick up a couple more fibers. They'll pick up some of the fibers from the ventral ramus of C2, they'll pick up some more fibers from the ventral ramus of C3, and they'll pick up a couple more fibers from the actual ventral ramus of C4. When all of these move forward, they go to two different destinations. One destination is gonna supply the trapezius. So one destination is gonna to go to the trapezius muscle. And the other destination is actually going to go to the sterno, clido, and I'm going to finish the name over here, mastoid. And the sterno, clido, mastoid helps to be able to flex the neck. The trapezius has many functions, helps to elevate the scapula, helps to retract the scapula. It can do a lot of different things, right? Now, why is this important? Because as you can see, the cervical plexus can give, via the lateral funiculus, it can give C1 all the way to C5 connections to form the, what is this red thing right here running up through the foramen magnum? This is called the spinal accessory nerve. The spinal accessory nerve will run upwards and gain some of the fibers from the cranial part of the accessory nerve, from the nucleus ambiguous, and run through the jugular foramen. Most of those fibers though from the actual accessory nerve, the cranial part will go with cranial nerve 10, the vagus nerve, which is to go and supply the pharyngeal muscles, laryngeal muscles, a lot of different structures. But very small amounts of those fibers from the cranial part will move with the spinal part of the accessory nerve. As it moves out, then what happens? Again, some of these fibers can actually go to the sternocleidomastoid, and some of these fibers will go to the trapezius. And then what else was really important? We also said that it was important that the C2 ventral ramus gave more fibers. C3 ventral ramus gave more fibers, and C4 ventral ramus gave more fibers. Why is that important? Because the sternocleidomastoid only gets those from C2 and C3. And the trapezius is only getting the, fi the ventral ramal fibers from C3 and C4. Another really important thing about this, I'll talk about it more, but when this actual accessory nerve tra uh, traverse 
continues forward and it gives off a branch of the sternocleidomastoid. It moves past this anatomical region, which is called the posterior triangle of the neck. And when it moves to that posterior triangle of the neck, that's when it gives off this branch of the trapezius. And that's important because it can have some clinical correlations. And we'll talk about that with the accessory nerve. Okay? So now that we have to understand all the connections that is moving with the accessory nerve. Okay, so we've pretty much done everything here for the cervical plexus. All right, Nigerian, so we talked a lot about the cervical plexus, and again, we went through almost every single type of route that you could have gone through. Obviously, there is some other smaller branches, but they're not as much clinically significant as, as we would really need to talk about them, okay? All right, Nigerians, we covered a lot about the cervical plexus. I really hope all of it made sense. I really hope that you guys enjoyed it. If you guys did, please hit the like button, subscribe, put some comments down in the comment section. All right, Nigerians, as always, until next time.